This is session one of three sessions that we're running. Um, what we wanted to do is look at the pillars of well-being to enable you to actually build a well-being strategy for your organisation. So session one today looks at mental well-being, session two looks at physical well-being, um, and session three looks at financial well-being as well. So obviously the question is why have a well-being strategy? That's the question we need to ask. Um, there's a lot of compelling reasons as to why we have a well-being strategy. Um, you know, and the, and the evidence from the CIBD research from last year is very compelling. You know, it creates better employee morale and engagement, a healthy and more inclusive culture, um, lower sickness absence in the long term, um, enhanced employer brand, you know, better staff retention, all these wonderful outcomes as well. And it's not just those particular reasons that compel us to actually develop a well-being strategy. It's actually the effect of COVID has made it even more important to have well-being strategies in place to support our employees. Um, some recent research that's been done um, by Hayes that looks at 16,000 employees found that the difference in people's well-being before and after COVID has had a significant impact regardless of industry. So from 38% in hospitality to 30% you know, in human resources. So what is the well-being support that employees perceive that they receive from um, their organisations? And I think that's quite important. I think sometimes employees aren't always aware of the support that's available to them. And 49%, and I'll just move uh, our gallery there, can actually, actually perceive that there's no support given. And, and others perceive that there's just 20% in terms of social activity. So, so what can we do as organisations to support our staff more um, during this very challenging time? So what we wanted to do is just do a quick poll and, and a couple of reasons why. We wanted to understand where you are on your well-being journey as well. Um, but also for Justin and for Sarah, our speakers today, just to understand a little bit more about who they're talking to today. So I'm just about to launch a poll. Um, you bear with me. So you've just had a poll that's just been launched. There's 87 of you. So there's two questions to ask. Um, what is the size of your organization and where are you in your well-being journey right now? So if you are a consultant, then just ask it on behalf of maybe an organization you're working for or with as well. So here are the numbers. We're just looking at them right now. So what is the size of your organization? Um, we've just, the numbers are going up. So fewer than 50 is 32%, um, quite a few for more than 5,000. Um, we're just seeing how many organizations actually have a well-being strategy. Um, a, a number don't have a well-being a formal strategy, but are acting flexibly. Um, the numbers are going up. We've got 62 voted so far. So just a few more of you to go. And then we've got a full picture. Great. So I'm just going to close this in just a few moments. Okay, I think we're just coming to an end now. So here's the results. So 27% uh, of you work for organizations of 1,000 to 4,999. 25% uh, of you work for organizations between 250 and 999. 21% uh, fewer than 50, um, and the rest between more than 5,000 and 50 to 249. So a really good spread of organizations as well. So that should really add to the conversation. And where are you in that well-being journey? So an overwhelming 55% of you um, don't have a formal strategy, uh, but are are trying to act flexibly on an ad hoc basis according to employee need. 29% uh, of you have a well standalone well-being strategy um, and 12% um, basically say that uh, you uh, are much more reactive rather than proactive as well. Okay so that See, it leads us into introducing our speakers for this evening. So Sarah Riesel is our first speaker for tonight. Um, she's a director of a really fascinating organization called Inside Out Leaderboard, and they're doing some great work in the space of engaging with senior leaders and getting them to be more, uh, encouraging them to be more open about their mental health. Um, and she's committed to eliminating the stigma associated with mental health problems in the workplace. And in her time working for Time to Change, um, has supported over 800 organizations of all different sizes develop a wellbeing strategy. Um, our second speaker tonight, and what we wanted to do is to have two um, perspectives, an external consultant that's worked with organisations um, and someone that's actually built a wellbeing strategy from the in inside. So this is Justin uh, Tyus. Um, he works for a fascinating organisation called the Corporation of London. Um, so those of you working in the city will know of it um, and he'll explain a little bit more about it. Um, he's a chartered member of his profession. Uh, I think it's fair to say he's a Jedi in health and safety and wellbeing management. So today's agenda, um, obviously we've done the introductions. Um, 
Sarah will be on first. She's going to talk for 15 minutes and be sharing strategies and tactics about what you can apply. During that time, we really encourage you to ask your questions for Sarah. Um, we'll then switch over to Justin um, and he'll talk for 15 minutes uh, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask your questions. And then at the end, we'll be signposting you to additional resources that you can continue your journey uh, in terms of supporting the well-being of your employees. So we just want to do a little bit of an experiment um, just to see how you work in those chat boxes and how we're feeling today. We're going to do something called Chatterfall. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. So if you look in the chat box next to you um, on the bottom row, um, you'll see that you've got an opportunity to actually write a comment in there. Um, what we'd like you to do is to just actually just write in there in one word how you're feeling today about the session or about your day in general. So I'm not going to ask you to do it just yet. I'm going to ask you to do it on the count of three. So when we ask you to count one, two, three, if you could do it then. So everyone just type in one word um, and then go for it now. So one, two, three, go. <laughs> First one I saw was hungry. <laughs> Positive, overwhelmed, great, tired, exhausted, stressed, excited, very good, deflated, fine, enthused so a really good cross uh, understanding of people's different experiences and and i guess blur if that's a word um about how we're feeling about our work and and therefore how do our employees feel as well so so with that um i'm going to hand over to sarah and sarah's going to take you through 15 minutes of, of really good insight uh and i really welcome sarah um, and thank you so much Hi, Garen. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for a really wonderful introduction, but even more so for everybody just turning up today. You know, it's six o'clock on a Wednesday. This is quite a big ask to come to yet another Zoom meeting. So I just want to sort of express extreme gratitude and tell you how, how much that tops up my reservoirs to see so many people caring about their wellbeing strategies and people caring about mental health in the workplace. So I work for Inside Out, the Inside Out Leaderboard, and I'm the director of the Inside Out Charter. And in a nutshell, the charter is a way of helping your organization to really engage your senior leaders in your wellbeing strategy and engage your senior leaders in the conversation around mental health. And it is a really important part, actually. So uh, as you saw, I, I spent years, I spent four years working at MIND on the workplace wellbeing team and during my time there, I worked on the Time to Change Employers Pledge. And I worked with hundreds and hundreds of employers to support them with developing wellbeing strategies, with understanding how to incorporate mental health into their wellbeing strategy. And I think that one of the most valuable things that I take away from there, other than understanding that if you don't have senior leadership buy-in, you, you know, you're really, you're really working way hard to get your strategy up and underway. But one of the things that I really appreciate from my time at Mind was understanding what works and what doesn't work and having this great kind of encyclopedia of knowledge and this file of facts of amazing, like incredible entrepreneurial HR leads, well-being leads, independent managers who have actually pushed this on the agenda. So the work that we do with Inside Out and the work that I did with Time to Change is mostly around stigma. And I know that I've got this really New Zealand accent. So when I say the word stigma, it's like stigma. I feel like some kind of New Zealand politician. So please forgive me. Uh, but stigma is the most uh, important thing that you need to kind of have resonating around in your head, not just before you start your wellbeing strategy, but actually during the whole process, it needs to be underpinning everything because the stigma attached to mental ill health and talking about it in the workplace is stopping people from reaching out before it hits crisis point. So I kind of, I, I, I promised a, uh, a, a, few, a few laughs. I, oft, I was joking with Garen the other day that I often get wheeled out because I do kind of talk about mental health as being quite funny. So I'm gonna give you an example of, of stigma, the difference between stigma around physical health versus the stigma attached to mental health. And it's, it's a good story. Please feel free to steal it. I've changed the name of my colleague and everything, but it's quite a compelling way to get people to understand what stigma means and what that looks like in the office. So a very long time, well, not that long ago, I was working with a colleague and I'm going to call her Jane. And I often accidentally say her real name out loud and I keep going, oh, I've got to try and remember not to. 
So Jane was one of my favorite colleagues, uh, an absolute hero of mine, you know, just a real blaze of glory, really super wonderful and uh, actually incredibly hardworking. So her, her place at work was, you know, that was a full workload. And on a Friday night or potentially a Saturday, not, not work time, so not during work time, uh, Jane was out and having drinks and wearing beautiful trademark stilettos. So she's out, she's having drinks, trademark stilettos, she's had too much to drink, she's laughing because she's hilarious, she steps in a gutter and she breaks her leg. So sorry if that's like some savage imagery there, but she breaks her leg. So we hear about this on Monday. Oh no, Jane won't be into work, probably for six weeks. You know, there's no prepping, there's no preparation towards what, who's going to take over her workload. But on Monday, the entire team is just galvanized into action. Oh my God, is she going to be okay? We do a whip around, we get 50 quid straight away for some flowers to be sent to her. We all write in a card to say, you know, we hope that you feel better soon. Take as much time as you want. We've got your back. You know, we, we were really, really, I was messaging, texting, are you going to be okay? That kind of thing. When she returned to work, so she returned for the first time, I think it was about after three or four weeks because she literally couldn't come into work. And we had shifted around her workload. Some of us were doing more than we, we used to, you know, some, we'd shifted it all around to cover her back. And she came back in uh, and it was, it was a hero's return you know, people clapped. We were so pleased to see her back at work. She came in at like 11 o'clock, came in for a visit. For the next couple of weeks while she was still on her crutches, you, you know, not only were the reasonable adjustments made by the workplace of making sure that the, the elevator was working so she didn't have to clamber up the stairs, the fact that her desk was closer to the toilet so that if she needed to go to the bathroom, it wasn't going to be a mission. The fact that she would walk into a, a, a lunchroom, and this is reasonable adjustments that we made as colleagues. She'd walk into the lunchroom, people would stand up. Do you want a seat? Are you okay? Can I get you a cup of tea? Is there anything that I can do for you? Additional reasonable adjustments were made where she was able to leave the office early and come in late for weeks because her crutches made it awkward for her to travel on public transport during rush hour. So the reason that I tell this story is like, first of all, she's my hero and I adore her and it was wonderful to be able to support her through this time. But I tell this story because it's in vast contrast to another organization where I worked where somebody was signed out sick from a, a doctor for two weeks and nobody was told why. They were there one day and they weren't the next. It wasn't communicated with us. It wasn't explained to us. There was no whip around for a card. Uh, they, they, after two weeks, there were groans of workload and covering so-and-so's workload. There were like kind of this annoyance at this person's absence. And when that person returned, there was an annoyance at that person's reasonable adjustments. And that actually didn't, that didn't go down well. That wasn't very nice. And, and the thing is, is that there's no difference. If somebody cannot come into work because they have an injury or because they're unwell, there shouldn't be any difference. There should be the same amount of empathy, the same amount of love, the same amount of heroes return, the same amount of clubbing together to do the work. There should be the same amount of, of that kind of balance. So I do use that story when I'm talking about stigma because it's a real life story that I experienced where I saw the difference between these two things. And it's a big reason as to why I do what I do today. So what we do at the Inside Out Charter and, and what I used to do with Time to Change is that I work as a consultant with employers, with people in HR and with heads of wellbeing to support them in designing the strategy to actually address the stigma related to mental ill health in the workplace. And we do that as a first measure. So before you have to worry about thinking about putting in mental health first aid training, which is fantastic, but before you have to worry about you know, all of the all of the things that you might need to do or getting yoga Fridays in or making sure that there's fruit in, in, in the kitchen space. All of those things are a nice to have, but the first thing that you should do and that I would advise that you do is look at this as a culture piece. Have a look at this as being a stigma piece where you're addressing the stigma attached to mental health problems. And the best way to do that is through sharing stories, opening up conversations and creating spaces where these things can happen. So just to give you some examples, because I want to give you some top tips 
Uh, also, please, I've got a very unique name that I cannot say myself in this country because of my vowels, but please do track me down on LinkedIn and connect with me and feel free to ask me questions. We, you know, we, we, I'm not going to suddenly sign you up for anything. I'm really happy to talk to people and get people to sign signposted to appropriate measures if needed. So please do feel free to, to, to just request to pick my brains on these things. But hopefully we'll get a lot of these out today. So the first instance, I think that you need to look at this as a cultural piece where you're opening up conversations about mental health in the workplace. This can be done really easily. So just to go back to that story about Jane and her broken leg and about the idea that nobody was, you know, and then the other colleague in my other workplace and nobody was told. So nobody got that communicated with them. And that's because mental health has traditionally been thought of as a really hush-hush topic. And so nobody, the head of HR wasn't going to come into our team and say, oh, by the way, Sally is being signed out with depression because it's such a taboo topic that that would be a breach of privacy. And I totally get that. But what you can do is on induction, when you hire somebody or during a policy refresh or during a, a, a revamp or during a survey, you can ask your staff how they would like to be communicated with and how they would like to communicate with others if they go through a period of mental ill health. So what you can say in your induction pack, and these are the, I'm just gonna throw at you tiny tweaks that you can do that already start to look at your wellbeing agenda. And it can come underneath the strand in your wellbeing agenda that says, uh, you know, policy review. And, and that can be a set thing that you can sit down and you can go, I'm going to look through all of the things that we do and how we communicate to get across that we're an organization that encourages open conversations. And you can change the wording in the induction pack or in the staff refresher to something along the lines of, if you fall ill with a physical or mental illness, how would you like us to communicate this with your colleagues? So that you are able to actually be responsive in a bespoke way to how individuals might feel. And that's a really nice way to show that you're an organization that encourages conversations. Another really important thing to do, and I'm gonna blast this constantly, I'm always like, spoiler alert, I'm gonna talk about senior leadership buy-in. Senior leadership buy-in is the most important thing that you can have, and the ways that you get senior leaders to show that they are on board for this commitment is that you need to engage them in this, you need to find one of them to be your sponsor. So you need to reach out to all of your exec team and you need to find a senior leader who's willing to sponsor the wellbeing strategy and they're willing to take it to board level. So when it's not a big ask, it's to say, can you include mental health on the agenda at least once or twice a year? So, one of, so that's one of the things that you can do. The other things that senior leaders can do in a really easy way that will actually help to model this best behavior is you can just ask them for small things, simple things. Things like adding something to their signature in their email. So adding underneath their signature in their email that they're a part of the, that they're the wellbeing team sponsor or that they're currently sponsoring mental health in the workplace. That's actually them saying out loud that they are an ally and that they're a senior leader that can be trusted. And that's a really important thing. Other things that you can do uh, that are quite easy to like have a little reflective look at is have a look at I mean, I, honestly, I've got like a thousand of these, but I've only got one minute left. But you can have a look at how your one-to-one, -one, uh, one-to-ones are run and just add a question. So if you have one-to-ones where your line managers have them with, with the, the employees at your work and they're in a structure or in a form and they look at how did your last month go for performance and they look at how did, you know, what, what are your projected targets for next month? And if you're doing a one-to-one -one properly, you're doing it monthly, what you can do is add another box in there that talks about mental well-being or well-being in the workplace. And it's not a terrifying topic. It can be as simple on a scale of one to 10. How have you been this month? How do you feel today? What, you know, it's just about en enabling people to have these conversations and empowering your line managers to actually know how to signpost if something does bubble up. And, and these, are, these are just a couple of tidbits uh, that I have for you, and I'm more than happy to take more questions. Um, I have a massive range of organizations I've worked with, from Unilever, um, currently working with Tesco's, Investors and in People. I work with big organizations, small organizations, lots of construction and transport organizations, so really varied audience. So hopefully I have something for you if you've got a question for me. 
Great, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and, and I guess one question that was coming up from me during then is, uh, when we were talking previously, is that there's there's quite a lot of presenteeism in this country. And if you think mm -hmm. about the actual amount of um, absence rates that are happening, do, do if an organisation is really open about mental health, you know, does that, do absent rates actually go up or down or how does it work for you? Right, excellent question. So the organisations I've worked with, usually it's, it's listen, it's a long term thing, it's something you're investing in, and the return is financial. So and this is the argument I make, do it because it's the right thing to do, but also do it because it makes business sense. What you'll typically see is after your first year, your absences related to mental ill health will go up. And that's a good thing. That's cause for celebration because that means that people are feeling like they can be honest when they're telling you why they're out of work. So your absences in general might go up a little bit, but you're looking at absences related to mental ill health going up. And that's something that's really important to present to your exec team as well because you're setting a reasonable expectation. It's going to go up after the first year. The second year, absences related to mental ill health might, might come down a little bit. And by the third year, that's when you're looking at your return on investment in a really big way. And just as just sorry to take up time, but just as an example of this, uh, you know, uh, when, when I was out of work, so I have a mental health problem that I live with and manage sometimes well and sometimes appallingly. Um, but I was out of work. I was signed up by my doctor for two weeks. And during that time, in that first week, I was I was unable to leave bed. I was fraught. I was having anxiety attacks. It was horrible. The second week, I actually started to get well. And by the Thursday, so I was due to return to work on the Monday. By the Thursday, I was so anxious about returning to work. I was really like, my anxiety levels lifted again. And had I not had an intervention by one of my line managers who literally sent me a text saying, if you fancy a chat, I'd love to talk to you before you come back into work, we've all got your back. And it was like I felt this huge, when I spoke to her on the Friday, I felt this huge kind of blanket lift off me to say, actually, I'm, you know, I'm going to be welcomed back. And, and the anxiety and the tension to do with coming back into work had dissipated. I went back on a phased return. I didn't need it. I was so glad to be back. I went back, I went, went back in late on a Monday, then I was back to my normal hours on the Tuesday and for the rest of the week and the rest of the year because work is good for mental well-being. It is good for you if it's done right. So yeah, I do think that, that what you see is less time and total being taken off. We can't cure mental health problems by just creating open spaces where we talk about them, but we can manage them, we can minimize them, we can support people who are experiencing them. So, you know, things will happen. People will still need to take time out from work, but the length of time that they take it will become less and less and less the more support that they receive from the workplace. Brilliant. And I'm, I'm reading the chat box and there's so many people, people are hungry for tips, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess one of the things you mentioned there is about the importance of engaging with senior leaders because it is a culture yep. piece. Um, can you give me examples of where you've actually worked with senior leaders and it has created some form of culture change? And how did they actually engage with the senior leader and encourage them to be brave and to be courageous? Sure. Actually, they've got a great example. I mean, I've got so many, but this one's great because it's, it's fresh and it's so close to my heart. I've done a lot of work with Southeastern Rail over the last couple of years, and it's one of my... Um, it's, it's a real favourite for me to work with because they have you know, it's been four years now. So they've got a real, I've got a really good solid case study of all of the things that work, the way that their advocate program works, everything that's going on. And I feel so privileged to have had that inside look into how they operate and how they did that. But they really started when um, Lee Walcott Ellis from Southeastern, he, he, he kind of started by speaking out openly about his own experiences of living with PTSD and, and just like really kind of saying it's important to talk openly about it. And we started working with their HR and with Lee when, uh, when I was still at Time to Change. And they really pushed forward that pledge. Now the senior leadership buy-in, so their senior leader, and I was talking today, I was like, oh, I've got such a crush on David Statham, because a business crush, but because he's, he's so awesome as a senior leader. He, he hasn't spoken openly about experiencing poor mental health, but he has spoken with such verve and passion about supporting those that do. He's empowered people to do this. Lee has, has been given so much power to support his attitude towards this agenda that he has actually been made. So the, his role is now, oh, I think it's head of mental health 
uh, and he has, so he went from being one thing, a line manager and working in the HR and doing something there, to them completely handing over the program to him and to the CEO saying, this is yours, take ownership of it, I love what you do. Furthermore, he turns up. So as a, as a senior leader who is present and turning up to anything to do with the mental health agenda, whatever they roll up, time to change pledge, David Statham's there. He's, he's a CEO in Charing Cross, shaking hands, signing bits of paper, saying, how are you to people? He's so involved, it's really, really impressive. He's empowered his staff to do this. He's allocated budgets. He understands the importance. And he also, you know, it's about, it's about really empowering champions in his workplace to take that work forward as well. But he's there and he shows up. So I think that like in terms of engaging your senior leaders, there's some things that we do to help. Inside Out Leaderboard helps. The leaderboard has 111 role models currently on the leaderboard that C-suite leaders from professional organizations like PWC, HSBC, got people from parliament on there who are all willing to step up and say, yeah, I've lived with mental ill health and I'm going to be visible about that. And it's, it's important to, to, to show that it's actually not being vulnerable or weak, but that actually it's a mark of power to speak with authenticity about who you are and what your health is and what's important to you. And role modeling from other senior leaders is really important and it's all there, it's a mark of respect now. So I think that getting your senior leaders to, to be visible, you don't have to ask too much of them, but what you want from them is to be on board with your agenda. Brilliant. And, and um, there's a lot of questions that come up about mental health um, first aid. And, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring Justin in on that um, and then obviously bring you into the discussion afterwards as well. We've got a, I've got a question from Maria. Um, and her question is, even if your absences go up when you when you have made an environment that is more open and accepting to mental health, do you think that the improvement in related performance, i.e. less damaging presenteeism, will actually give good uh, or great our return on investment? Yes. And I also believe that, what, so I, I, it's so important to me that I actually wrote it on my pad in big capital letters. If you can capture data, then, then you, and you can measure things right from the beginning, and you can think of how you can do this, that's power on your side. So whilst you're already measuring absences related to mental ill health, also measure attitudes. So measure attitudes or the words in power, like how questions that you include in your surveys, things like, how empowered do you feel to speak to your line manager if you have a mental health problem? And you can, so you can measure not just absences, you can measure empowerment levels, you can measure the culture of your workplace, collect as much data as you can, because it's data that will support your business case when it comes to asking for budget to do things like improve an advocates program or run a champions program or run an event or do a, a lunch and learn or get somebody in to do training or get people, some a neuroscientist to come in and talk about mindfulness. You need money to do these things, but data will get you that money. So anything that you can measure right from the get go, Justin's nodding because he knows, he knows the secret of data. <laughs> so yeah, I think that that can be covered there. But yes, performance, performance goes up. Presenteeism is not our friend. People turning up and not doing their job is not our friend because someone coming in and doing what, what's you know effectively two hours worth of work in an eight hour working day, and they do that five days in a row, it's, it actually leads to exhaustion. You're not getting your money's worth out of somebody. They're not getting their cultural input from the workplace as well. It's a symbiotic relationship. And that's what you're managing as HR. You're managing not only your organization, you're also managing your staff and you're trying to get them to both be rewarded. Gary, you. you're on mute. I know, it's that classic Zoom thing. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, um, Sarah. Really, really appreciate it. The, the, the chat box is really warming up and, and it looks like mental health is such a big discussion point as well. Uh, and thanks, Maria, for that question as well. So we're going to move over to, to Justin now to give you sort of an insider's perspective um, about the work that he's done at the Corporation of London. Um, and then we'll come back for Q&A. So please keep the questions coming in uh, and then we'll have a sort of a general Q&A at the end with Sarah and with Justin as well. So thanks so much and, and handing over to Justin. Great, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, 
So yeah, I'm very pleased to be here to talk about um, the what the City of London Corporation has done in terms of, of mental health and also around the sort of wider wellbeing piece. Um, <clears throat> I'm coming before you really not, I guess, want to put at the outset, I'm not an expert, but actually this is something that I have a real passion for. Um, the reason I was particularly in, um, or particularly got involved with, you know, mental health first aid training, which I'd like to talk a little bit about if I have time, is that my daughter, um, about the age of 14, she had a diagnosis of mixed anxiety and depression. And um, it was a really challenging time. And my manager at the time had uh, left the City of London Corporation and I stepped up and I had the opportunity to become a mental health first aid instructor. It was a challenging time, but actually I did it the instructor training for, for, you know, obviously for various reasons. And one of them was because I wanted to learn and wanted to find out a lot, a lot more. So six years on, um, my daughter is um, in the recovery phase. She has a, has, a, has a job and she's now working after lots of challenges. But I really wanted to come back to something and I thought it really did resonate with Sarah said around stigma because for a young person, I've seen how that's affected uh, someone in terms of their life choices, but also in the workplace, I think is, is, is really important as well, because um, I've done training sessions where I've asked um, in our organization, how do we feel about sort of talking about opening up conversation? I think it's exactly right that Sarah talked about. I think there are lots of things that you can do, but I think one of the things is around storytelling and is around opening up that conversations. And I think for mental health first aid training, which is not a panacea, um, is certainly something that I think is really important um, to, to do in your organization and also mental health awareness training as well. So I work for the City of London Corporation. It is a vast uh, organization. It's been around for 900 odd years. It predates Parliament. And we have everything in the corporation from our own mini zoo to Heathrow Animal Reception Centre, Tower Bridge, the Barbican, three independent schools, our own police force. Geographically, we are spread outside of the, the, the city, the square mile, where we are the, if you like, the local authority, so Burnham Beaches, Hampstead Heath. So one of the things is we are an extremely diverse organisation in terms of our people and the things that we do. It's not just statutory function. We've uh, taken on lots of things over the years. So we have lots, we have a very diverse workforce. So one of the things I really think is important is around um, one size doesn't really, doesn't fit all. So actually building your mental health and wellbeing strategy, you've got to think about that. So things I'd like to focus on really is, it is sometimes about getting the right people in the right place. And yes, you need to have your champions, but it's also the people who also, I think, sit underneath that as well. So your managers, empowering your managers, because the things that, that's come out, for example, of mental health first aid training. And there has been some criticisms, don't get me wrong. As I said, it's not a panacea, but one of the evidence bases for some, for is it having an effect is that managers often feel that they don't feel that they have the right skills to start those conversations and don't know what to do. So um, mental health first aid and mental health awareness training are good ways of starting those conversations and and actually getting managers to be able to ask and to to think about the the questions that are important that are important so i'm quite passionate about 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 what we do and, and how we do things um we did sign this the time to change please but it's also about what well, how then do you then this was quite a while ago so we we signed the time to change and said that as an organization we were going to to um um work on ending stigma around mental ill health and it is certainly there present in our organization as it is elsewhere i had done a piece of training on mental health first aid and i got a call from one of our mental health first aiders in a part of our organization and he said um would you mind coming down and talking to the management team he said most people well everybody's really supportive but one of our colleagues has uh, disclosed voluntarily disclosed that they think they might be suffering from a um a, um um, a, a, Ill, a mental illness and they were, and it might be a psychotic type illness and so um so there's been some questions asked about well should we be putting this colleague in front of you aren't, aren't people the question was you know vi perhaps violent and actually the perception out there is sometimes that the you know we pick up ideas and things in the media everyone wants to be supportive but there's a question in the back of people's mind it's not to say people who suffer from psychotic type illnesses 
aren't occasionally violent, but it's not a violence is not a symptom of mental health. You're more likely to be struck by lightning than, than actually to be um, killed by someone suffering from, from mental health. So it's, I think it's really important to, to actually to tell those stories and to work on the, you know, the, the myths and to support your managers and to support the other parts of the organization. The other thing that I think is really important in terms of, of how you set this piece is, I had a, a, my manager who left our organization and we spent quite a lot of money on initiatives such as you know, step challenges. We spent an awful lot of money at our Guildhall site on putting in a step challenge, putting in glossy signs, um, having apps that you could actually um, read the steps and count them and go up the stairs and things like that. And we did a challenge and it cost a lot of money. And when my manager left, um, I was contacted by the organizer. I said, oh, would you like to run another challenge? That will, you know, you for, for a couple of thousand pounds, we'll run another challenge for you. And I said, oh, no, no, thank you very much. Um, and then again, would you like to do something else? And then the free app that you have, are oh, we going to charge you for the app? So the, the whole thing was not really embedded and actually was a, a lot of money went down the drain. So actually, I think we had to go back and to focus on what was really important for our organization. So I think it's sometimes a little bit of a cliche to say sometimes less is more. So we went back and we looked at the data as we talked about with Sarah talked about saying it's really important to understand your organization. Now, most or almost exclusively organizations, mental ill health, um, stress, anxiety, depression is going to be the, the, the biggest reason for, for example, sickness, absence. So and again, given a small resource base, we had to go back and we had to focus on what was really important for our organization. So we focus on, on, on mental health as our key priority supported by a broader health promotion piece as well. So we, what we tried to do in terms of embedding um, what we did was around the storytelling. So I think one of the things that you can do as an organization is to say, okay, well, what, what works? What things can we, we sort of hook ourselves onto? So PwC, I think, originally had the This Is Me stories. So where um, colleagues um, would be willing to sort of talk about their, 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 their mental health challenges or ill health and say, you know what, I may have suffered from mental ill health. However, it doesn't stop me from adding fantastic value to our organization. And actually, we've just launched a video this week of one of our colleagues, the head of maintenance at New Spitalfields Market, has, said, has put him out and said, put him up and said, I've suffered from mental ill health. I've had this particular thing and that. And it's in, it's in the, the we, we shared this video more widely. Um, and he's talked about some of the challenges that he's, he's faced. And I think that can be really, really, really powerful. It's also, as Sarah talked about, the sort of champions, that sometimes you'll have senior leaders in your organization who might be willing to step forward and to share their stories and challenges. Because let's really be honest, everyone has had challenges at some point in their life, some more so than others. And, and I think it's actually really important that you, if you can find people who are willing at a senior level to share their stories, um, that can be really helpful and, and also uh, also open up dialogue as well. For example, um, we had a, um, one of our senior leaders who disclosed some things about what had happened to them in their past, and we did it as just a piece on our intranet. People read it, and this um, particular senior leader said that actually people were contacting her and saying, oh, thank you for sharing that story. Um, can you tell me more? And actually, you, you've, you've allowed me to talk about things that I actually felt I couldn't talk about before. So I think really opening up those dialogues, those conversations are really, really important as well. The other thing is you have to have other things to sort of kind of hook your, your, uh, your, your um, mental health and wellbeing um, strategy upon. So we do have a wellbeing ambassadors network and we do try and do a lots of broader health promotion pieces as well. And I think sometimes as well, it's around the sort of qualitative type side of the, the thing. So collecting the data is really important, but also sometimes it's collecting those stories and about knowing you're having an effect. You can have the big versus data versus the little thing. So for example, we have a, um, um, a, 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 an organization, DWP, who are commissioned to do um, drug and alcohol services and education for us. And I happened to see a colleague outside of my work on an occasion and he didn't look in a great state and I said oh, are you okay because this is one thing you know and, he, and oh perhaps you know I said as an off-the-cuff thing oh, I'll have a drink sometime and this particular person said well that's possibly compounding the thing and I didn't think any more of it 
Well, some months later, we put on a free workshop education piece around drug and alcohol. We didn't get that many people turn up, which you might think on one hand is actually a bit disappointing. And it was, but this particular individual turned up. And after the session, they contacted me discreetly and said, may I have the contact details of the, the, the sort of the, the train, the instructor? I said, yeah, no problem at all. And I didn't ask any further questions. Then some months later, I happened to meet them and the person said, I'd like to give you some confidential feedback if that's okay. And I said, yeah, well, if, if you're comfortable with that. So they said, um, actually, I contacted the, 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 the trainer, the instructor, and actually through this route, I'm actually getting some specialist support and counseling for something that happened in my childhood. And I feel I'm being really supported. So actually, sometimes it is the small little things that I think that you do in an organization, as well as the big data that actually can make a real um, difference to to what it is that you, that you need to do. So I think it's really important to have those um, champions tell those stories. The other thing that I think is really important, I think has has happened, is that looking at the data really, just that quick uh, pop quiz, is that actually a lot of you have got source a, a significant proportion of you have a mature, perhaps well-being strategy in your organization it's and again it's about how can you make those fresh because actually from the corporate perspective actually at the beginning when you start your initiatives there is perhaps if you get the right buy-in is you get the, the feed and actually it has traction and it will go but you do have to adapt your strategies and actually um, go with for example the um, the themes and the days and actually you have to sometimes tackle some of the really more difficult and more pertinent issues as well so lot in September, we had, um, um, it was Suicide Prevention Awareness Day. And so we did a piece around that. And again, one of the things that I think is really, really important for organization is, is actually what are the big things that, for example, men in particular, not just exclusively, don't want to talk about their mental health. And they don't want to talk about the things that are bothering. The other thing is we think it's really important if you can bust some of those myths and actually think about, well, how can you empower people to, to ask someone, are you okay? Or if you have that gut feeling sometimes around someone being, you know, I've got a real concern, something doesn't seem right. Sometimes the tendency is I don't want to say anything because what if I ask the wrong thing? But actually the evidence is that actually the very best thing that you can do is to actually ask that question, be it that is a difficult thing to sometimes have to do. I've had to ask that question for people and it's not an easy one to do. The other thing, just coming back, because I need to sort of wrap up and just to, to, to think about a few things as well. It's also about having the right people in the right places, getting the right resources and support. We're in the, the city. We are actually a very small team. So there's myself, my colleague, Sandrine Pluvio, Health, Safety and Wellbeing. And she's a really fantastic. Wellbeing is really part of what she does. And we have an apprentice. And for our organisation, we couldn't function without the support and the actual working practices and developing strategies and actually relationships with others. So one of the signs that I think is a success of one of the things we've done is we have a wellbeing ambassadors network and it's a corporate network, but one of our departments, our markets and consumer protection has actually set up its own network and it's actually part of what um, is, it's doing something that is actually important for the markets themselves because they work shift patterns, they work differently to us and they've invited us in to be part of that change. So I think that is a really building on a success is actually not to be frightened that if you've done something and others in your organization want to take it on and share it and own it, I think that's a really, really important piece as well. So um, I think I'm sort of almost coming to the end of, 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 of my time. Um, I think it's obviously important to get your networks right. It's important to focus on on Ritz, what's really important um, to you. Um, um, uh, your networks can be obviously much beyond, you know, uh, um, mental health first aid. There are wider well-being pieces that sometimes picked up very nicely in 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 the network pieces. So I think that can be picked up there. The other thing that actually, if you, if, you, if you do put in mental health first aiders. And I'm a big advocate of it, but as I said, they're not a panacea, is that you have to think about supporting the supporters. So the big piece of work that we've done in the corporation is to actually say, we need to put a network in place to support those people. And that's what we've done. We need to provide you with CPD opportunities and buddying. And actually, we need to give you some information and guidance around boundaries 
um, and around safeguarding as well because we because clearly these colleagues who are taking on this they're doing it as a voluntary and in voluntary role and actually they're not experts and neither am I and actually we need to be very clear about what we what we do if things come up there and we have to support the people who are doing the embedding so we've been quite successful in doing those sorts of things so finally wrapping up is really focus on resources focus on what's really important for your organization find out the bits that are important as Sarah said have your champions tell those stories and people will be more willing to actually go out and say you know what I, I could talk about this I had a very senior manager uh, say actually that, that they'd used our employee assistance program you know as soon as senior manager says that well actually other people are okay to say things like you have your big wins, but also celebrate your small wins as well. Celebrate inside your organization. We have lanyards to recognize our mental health first aiders. Um, we do, as part of our staff awards, we recognize excellence there around well being. You know, adapt your strategy. It won't, one size won't fit all. It will become more mature, and you'll need to get other people on board, and you'll need to adapt it, and you'll need to get others to help you to do you know, and to deliver that strategy. Our schools have a very different strategy to some other parts of the organization because we're so diverse. So getting the right people in the right organization, getting the information out and supporting is, is I think, really, really important. That's, I think I've done enough talking. Thank you very much, but I'm happy to answer any questions I can. Brilliant. Thank, thank you so much, Justin. And there's, there's so much value in there. Um, and, and one of the things that I was sort of reminded of during our initial conversation is, is, is how many staff does or how many employees does the Corporation of London have? We're about 5,000 which also includes the City of London Police, um, civilians and uniform officers as well. And what was your well-being budget when you started? I had a well-being budget of almost zero so we have done it through developing our champions, um, obviously you know bidding for the right resources as well so we've had to start from actually being virtually nowhere to then to to making the case again and asking and, and developing from there but I think you can do quite a lot with with little money and resources but you can't do you know you do need to make those cases and you need also need to keep demonstrating that you're adding value and also you need to actually you're competing for lots of other messages in your organization and as that's why I'm saying the the, the strategy will mature and you need to find other ways of reaching out to people and and keeping people on board Brilliant. And just picking up on a question from, from Desiree um, in relation to that is, um, I'm starting in a newly created role focusing on well-being. Um, what is one tip you can give as to where to start with helping mental health and well-being? Well, I would say if you're able to do some baseline surveying and asking people, the one intervention, I and, and obviously finding out a little bit more, but the one intervention I would do would would be if you can is around sort of um, you know, mental health awareness because it, it may only be awareness but it does actually open up people's eyes to you know the case that or that, that Sarah described around her colleague things like that will be discussed about and be explored and it gives people a safe opportunity to talk about some of these things so I, I think that's one thing that you can do in terms of there's a lot of evidence to suggest that um, the storytelling and open up conversations will will help to break down the stigma and, and bust some of those um, you know those perceptions or that people sometimes have. Brilliant, thank you. And um, obviously we're into the last nine minutes, so we just want to create as much value as possible. So I'm going to try and invite Sarah in as well. So you're free to answer some of these questions as well. Um, there was a particular question in terms of from from Kasia, um, and she asked the question: Is there any other type of data worth collecting? besides for absence reason, to support the wellbeing initiative? Yeah, well, so I was saying earlier that it's really uh, beneficial to do a staff temperature check. So the data that you've got anecdotal can work. Um, the other thing is, and I, I kind of want to hark back to a point that Justin made, which I, I love. Uh, you know, once you've got, and I'm seeing a lot of talk about getting mental health first aid training and, and doing a lot of that. I feel like if you're not doing a temperature check before you organize the mental health first aid training, that you might be jumping the gun a little bit. So mental health first aid training is amazing, but as a standalone piece, 
as you were saying, Justin, it, it's not your it's not your sole goal. And what you might find is that you're not just throwing a lot of money at at what you think might fix the culture, but that you also might be um, leaving these people that have been trained to kind of stagnate and stagnate without support. So I've seen in organizations before where they've trained up a bunch of mental health first aiders that, and because the culture is still, is still a culture where people don't speak openly, they don't get used. And the problem with that is that you've got these people that have received this incredible training, feeling like they're not actually useful and feeling like maybe that training is disappearing or going away. So one of the things that you can do is create the, an advocate program. So as Justin was saying, make sure that you have people that can support the people that have been trained. So it's really good to use peer support to do this, but also it's important to measure the interventions that your advocates have. So if you have a bunch of mental health first aid trained people, set something up from the beginning that measures the interventions. You don't have to take names to do this, but if you're measuring how many interventions you're seeing and you're also measuring what kinds of things, so just like, are they talking about grief, financial concerns, are they talking about uh, stress at work, is it all predominantly coming from one department? You know, these kind of things can actually really support any of the future work that you do. So that's one side of things. But I, I recommend, and I put, I put it in the chat box, that my one piece of advice to do is when you're starting out, look at this as a culture piece. And going back to what Justin said as well, ask your audience, ask people through a staff survey and start your measurements from there. So your baseline survey is how empowered do you feel to speak to your line manager about mental health problems? Do you think our organization cares about mental health problems? You know, you can ask some really nice on a scale of one to 10 questions and it doesn't have to be a long survey. And you might actually find quite high engagement levels on that survey. And that's the kind of thing that you need to keep returning to. So you do that survey before you start anything. Then you do that survey after you've had a little push. Then you do the survey again after six months. Then you do the survey again after a year. And what you'll find is that you'll start to see what people think, whether or not the things that you're doing matter or count. Add to the survey with the interventions that you get. After six months of rolling out your stigma strategy and talking openly and doing a really low key campaign that gets people talking and sharing stories, then you might do, we're gonna get mental health first aiders in. Do it with structure. Don't do it in panic because, you know, they need that structure as well for themselves. And, and it is Mental Health First Aid England does provide this training and there are lots of avenues for that. But there are other places that you can go to for training as well, depending on what kind of organization that you have. For example, Construction has made some mind. Um, mind, who I used to work for, do incredible bespoke uh, mental health training as well. So there's lots of lots of things that you can find. So don't feel like you you have to be pigeonholing yourself into any one area. Brilliant. Some, some, some great strategies there. And we've got, we've got time for one final question. So um, this is from Jacqueline Crouch. Um, having a mental health first aiders group is great for mental health awareness, uh, but what about one-to-one -one support for employees' mental health and wellbeing by qualified professionals? Do you want me to look at this one? Yep, yeah, nope, that's fine, whoever you'd like to go for it. Okay, cool. And I also get Justin in on this as well, because this is this can be quite a hard ask, because what we're looking at there is money. Uh, and, and that's tough. If your employer has an EAP service, this should be included in some way, shape or form. So most EAP services will offer six uh, appointments with one-to-one -one counselling that are completely anonymous. And what I found, uh, just in terms, I'm just going to pull out some stats. Data is your friend. Um, <laughs> what I found uh, uh, when it comes to, to EAP services is that the national average use of an EAP service pre-COVID was 2.5%. So that's organizations really paying for a service that they're not using. I used to get uh, my organizations that I was working with, and I still do now, to get to really engage their EAP service, their employee assistance program, just because I, re I realized that I throw out acronyms left, right and center. Uh, so, so get them to come and engage your audience, get them to ramp it up, get them to come and explain. It's anonymous. It's not just for you, it's for your partner. It's, you know, it covers physical health. We, we offer financial support. So you need to get them to come in and kind of up their ante as, an, as a service to your staff. And also the stigma piece will support using an EAP service, include it in every piece of signposting. You put a, you do a 
This is like, if this is cheap, this is a cheap way to do something. Do a toilet campaign, make a poster that says, you know, we really know that this is, I know it's difficult in COVID, but if you do have staff on the ground, do a bathroom campaign where you have a poster that, that says that you care about mental wellbeing and really explicitly says, we have an EAP service, please use it. If you're doing it through, you know, you can do the same thing with a poster campaign through emails, through WhatsApp, when you've got people working remotely. Be really clear about what it is, bullet point it out, don't include long spreads, send an email that has three bullet points with big writing saying, we have an EAP service. If you need them, call them, here's their number. Just start to get that engagement up. So most organizations will have that. And if you don't have that, it's okay. You've got other places that you can contact, for example, Samaritans, 24 hours. There's uh, Calm, which is really, really fantastic as well. And I've forgotten the name, Justin, you might remember the one, the text messaging one, where you can actually just text and you get an immediate response as well. Then there are other things like the app, which is uh, NHS approved as Thrive, which is fantastic. So Thrive can work with you that will put people up with clinically trained people to support your staff as well. So there's a lot of really amazing services out there, but bear in mind, if you are going to pay for a service, you need to do the work to advertise and market it because don't pay for something that doesn't get used. Brilliant. And Justin, anything you wanted to add to that point finally? No, I agree. I mean, we have a, an employee assistance program and we are using them because they've done a, a session for us this week and the lead up to Well Mental Health Day at the weekend. So they've done a free session for us. Yeah, get the message out there. And um, the other thing we're very lucky as our organisation with our uh, occupational health service and um, we you can, um, colleagues can get counselling through there as well similar sort of arrangement so yeah do use the resources you got do promote them and yeah I think Samaritans as Sarah said 116123 really you know ask for Joe you know you know that kind of thing it's really really help so there's there's lots of stuff out there so so use it the other thing I was to say finally is you need to adapt so we have adapted our mental health first aiders so we have a virtual mental health first aiders so I have had people contact me um um, and again, it is about getting the governance right, as I tried to intimate earlier. You do have to have the governance to support the supporters, but use your resources, such as your mentor, the ones who are willing to be virtually contacted by a phone or others, and be very clear, as we always are, they are not counsellors, they are not therapists, they are just a listening ear who will listen to you, won't give advice, but can signpost. And yes, there are lots of other good organisations out there where you can get training. And Samaritans as well, actually, very good about the listening piece. Samaritan do some really good listening training and uh, and, and how to listen um, and not interrupt people. Brilliant. Guys, thank you so much for your time. Honestly, um, I think just a few things that I'm taking away from today's session. So, you know, budget is not a constraint to doing great things. Small teams of people can do great things. Um, that's some of the things I'm taking away from this. Um, the, you know, the importance of the multiplier effect, the fact that actually having champions working on your behalf in the organization can have a, com a big impact. Um, the fact that you can adapt your message to, 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 to difficult to reach groups like men, men's groups, for example, which Justin was sharing. Um, that data is your friend. Um, the importance of that this is a culture change piece. You know, it's much bigger than just a tick box exercise. Um, and the importance of engaging with senior leadership and the power of them just turning up and providing their sponsorship just by being there is so important. And also that this is as much as anything, it's a marketing exercise. You know, you like Justin said, you are competing against other parties to make sure that your message gets out there. So use your channels and your connections across the organization to make sure that you're reaching out to the people. So um, as, as Justin said, it is World Mental Health Day on Saturday the 10th. 10th, which is great stuff. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, just Justin and, and Sarah just to say goodbye to everyone. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone for your time and for giving up your uh, rainy uh, Wednesday evening. Um, and we're really looking forward to hopefully seeing you at our next event on October the 13th as well. So thanks very much, Sarah. Thanks very much, Justin. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a really good evening. Thank yeah. you. And thank you. And take care. And, uh, you know, go out there with passion, find your information and, and make a difference.